Hi everybody, this is Phil Kerner, the Tool and Die Guy, and this is Real Life Manufacturing, Part 1. And what we're going to do in this series is go through the thousands of photographs that I've amassed in the last six or seven years as the Tool and Die Guy. And you know, some of them didn't quite make a, an entire lesson at thetoolanddieguy.com, but there's still teaching points to be had here. Some of them are just fun to look at, and I know a lot of people uh, on social media and people who love the trade, they just like to look at things people do in different shops. So that's uh, kind of what I'm doing here. I'm sharing a lot of, uh, the, of the work I've done in the last several years with you. And uh, hopefully there'll be a few teaching points. I plan on doing this quite often. So again, that's why this is Real Life Manufacturing Part 1. So this is no theory. This is the stuff I do every day. So uh, no special order here, but let's get started. So here's an interesting part here, and let's take a look at this. This is a big tube, right? And uh, as you know, I'm in the tool and die guy, but one of the things I do where I work is specialty items, right? Uh, they need two of this, one of that, build a fixture, do this, grind something, three of these. This, that's my day, which keeps me entertained. So let's take a look at this, this piece of tubing. And what I've got to do here is I've got to drill a few half inch holes on the top of this. Well couple issues here right um, first of all I've got to pick up on the center line of this uh, tube here that's on this angle and I've got about three or four of these to do not a bunch but you know so I'm gonna set up a little bit of a stop here so I can just slide them in rotate the pipe correctly so it's perpendicular and this angles picked up correctly each time so we're gonna do a little math here so let's take a look at the setup I've got a curt vice here and uh, basically what I've got here is that pipe is sitting flat on the uh, jaws of the or the uh, base of the vise, and I've got a parallel out here that's the same height, two and seven eighths. So now we've got the pipe sitting here, but I had to put it up on uh, some sort of a riser, and I happen to have this tilt plate, so I just set it at zero degrees, and that got me up enough to clear the uh, bottom of the pipe, the end of the pipe from the table. So that all worked out. And there's different way, ways I could have done this, but this was a quick way, and it worked out well. So again, uh, like I said, I've got to pick up my hole locations. Not only uh, the easy part, of course, is on the center line of the pipe, but now I've got to find the center line this way of this angled uh, leg here, and that's where they dimension it from. So how are we going to do that? Well, a couple different things here. First of all, what I did, because if you've noticed, my table has a lot of holes in it. Every other hole is a half-inch dowel pin or a half-inch 13 um, bolt hole and uh, I've got a couple center drills in there they slide in there nicely spot drills if you want to call them that two four six block this piece here is from my old mold making days this is a big plate uh, not a big plate with a, but a large uh, two inch diameter roll on it and that's an old two inch diameter end mill and uh, um, I was able to EDM a hole through and then bolt through it so this is how I used to check angled walls on cavities and cores but for this purpose, it's working great as a stop because when you're working with angles, uh, you need some sort of a, a round uh, part here, a round surface to hit the angle in the same spot every time. So that's all I did was clamp this plate with this two inch roll on it to set up a stop. Now, if we go um, to the next slide, that's a little bit more of an overview. This 246 block, which is bolted to the table, is used to keep the pipe perpendicular uh, back and forth this direction. I guess we call it the Y direction, if that makes sense. So we've slid it up on the X direction, left and right, um, to have a stop. And then we've put this on the table. Again, you can see I've got some pins in here to get make sure this was nice and parallel. And that's where these tables are, these pins. They are a pain, you know, to blow out. You know, they are a mess, but Boy, they're nice for setup. So then I just rotate the pipe and the vise until it is perpendicular and hits this 246 block here as I push it up against this roll, and then I tighten the vise. So there you have that. Then, of course, it's easy to pick up the back and forth Y axis, find the center of the pipe. And that next thing I did was I, and I'll show you why, I use an electronic edge finder. You can use whatever you want, but. Uh, I picked up on the top of the pipe because I had done a math problem and uh, what the math problem told me, and I'm sorry, this is just a, not even a good screenshot, I just took a picture of 
my computer with a camera. I'm usually better than that, but that's what I have. Okay, <laughs> so I'm just follow along. Um, there's my hole locations. They're based off the center line here, and I figured it out if I touched on the top with my edge finder, which is a ball, right? Uh, Four hundred thousandths ball, and uh, if I touch on the top and go down five inches, move over, touch the pipe. There's all my math. It's uh, three hundred sixteen thousand, three hundred sixteen and a half thousandths back to center line, and then from there I've got my dimensions. So the trick to picking up the top of the piece first was to be able to do my trig, come down five inches, touch, use that ball dimension there. And then I have all my dimensions, okay? And here, this picture here shows that. I've touched the top of the tube, dropped down five inches, touched here, and now I'm all set to go. Again, I've got a ball here that's going to, a roll ball, whatever you want to call it, act as a stop every time. And this 246 block will make sure I uh, repeat as far as uh, the pipe, how it's laying in the vise perpendicular back and forth odd piece to say the least and that's kind of what it looks like sitting in the maze act, uh ready to go so did a lot of things there I got a ball dimension or a ball holding a, uh, uh, a stop got another block here keeping the pipe straight got a side plate or tilt plate underneath the vise to uh, make sure I could clear the table so that's kind of a typical thing they uh, pass my way this slide just shows, uh, I just thought I'd take a picture of it. Just, my bench can look like that sometimes, and that's okay. Once in a while, your bench, you know, is a little bit of a mess, but I remember a long time ago, my boss told me, make sure it looks like you put your stuff there and not through it there. So both vices that I normally use on that table are here. Uh, as you can see, all the setup clamps and step blocks to put them back on are right there, ready to go back in. I have two uh, electric drills, portable, uh, rechargeable drills, Milwaukee's that I use for deburring, and just some other tools here. Of course, we can see there on the table, we've got a, a just a regular machinist vise or whatever you want to call it, bench vise. A couple of uh, uh, spray bottles down here. That's one, that one is some rust inhibitor. That one's some soldered solvent that I use to clean up sometimes. I think it was summertime. So I've got the industrial fan blowing 60 miles an hour in my face awesome and then we've got the uh my 500 pound crane with a magnet on it which is a really nice feature to have once you get to that point big time saver now here's an oddball part we get these plastic or vinyl the the this that this black piece here this is kind of like the stuff you'd see that you put on the they call them stair treads so this is not hard plastic this is just real soft vinyl that I need to machine the right side and put this angle on it to some sort of a dimension and you'd think uh, you know ugh, you could just cut this off some easier way but I have to machine them so I've got a sub plate set up here in my vise and then I put two pins in the uh, with the, the, the sub plates much like the machine table every inch and a half I've got a half inch dowel or half inch half 13 screw hole um, so I've pounded a couple dowels in there and then I've got a uh, just a bar of a coal roll in there that I can bump this plastic up against and then you can see see how warped it is but for the ends I just use pieces of wood that I push up against to hold this angled part of this vinyl up against so I can hold some sort of a tolerance and keep the stuff from flopping while I'm machining it and if I don't get this these pieces of wood right in a perfect position every time it's okay um, we'll just mill a little bit off them as we machine. I usually, you know, I haven't seen these in a while, but I usually get like you know, 20 or 30 of these to do. So that's how I, I do those. And uh, if we were to look at the next picture here, kind of a more of an overview, I cut the right side, then I cut the angle. They're more uh, difficult to deburr than they are to machine because they just uh, throw up all this fuzz everywhere. But again, you can see what I'm doing here two strap clamps holding this long bar in. The long bar is pushed up against two pins to keep it straight. And then uh, these two strap clamps hold the wood down, which press it up against the bar. And at least we're, again, we're, we're got some stability. As you can see again, see how that part's just warped? It's just a piece of vinyl. And one more shot of that. Uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, maybe you can see some things you couldn't see in the other pictures. There's the bar, the two pins. 
not a big deal, but the things you have to do some days. Uh, once in a while, not very often, I do get some precision grinding work, and this is kind of a challenge. This is a, uh, a little hardened pin, and uh, this groove is one millimeter wide, and um, you know, it's called 40 thousandths, and I had to dress the grinding wheel down to 40 thousandths wide and put the part in a, a whirly jig. That's a Herrig, I believe, grind all whirly jig. And what I'm doing there is uh, grinding the slot. The slot was supposed to be within, uh, I think, a, a half a thousand tolerance on the location, which was fun. But a little tip here, whenever you're going to do this type of form grinding, that thin, you've got to use a very fine grit wheel. And two things about that. First of all, uh, you can only hold wheels like that 40 thousandths wide with fine grit. And if you use a 46 grit, when I say fine grit, that's a 100 grit wheel. And I only dress it back to bare minimum to clear the diamond out, but you don't want you're not going to dress that way back, okay? Like an inch, you no need for it. And that's a hundred grit wheel. But the trick to dressing a wheel that thin, sharp diamond. And for you guys that do this every day in your grinder hands, I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that. For me, who does a job like this once a year, uh, some of the basics come back to me, and all I know is a dull diamond will just break that wheel once it starts getting really thin. So I had a nice sharp, uh, they call them uh, phono diamonds. It looks like uh, something you play, a, believe it or not, a record. Does any of you know what a record is anymore? But it's a very sharp, very small diamond on my uh, wheel dresser. And that enabled me to dress that to 40 thousandths and grind that slot in there. All right, back to some normal, uh, real-life manufacturing stuff. How's this one? Mighty Mags. You know, I love my Mighty Mags. I've had them for 35 years, I think, one of the first things I bought. Well, about a year or two ago, I ended up with some stuff at an auction, and in the box were some brand new knockoffs from China. And you can see it says China on there, and they did a pretty good job trying to knock it off, didn't they? They don't waste time over there. <laughs> it's like they stole the uh, stole the uh, the uh, die for this, and uh, or the, whatever they used to cast this thing, uh, and uh, just got rid of the letters right and just did that because look at the similarities but that's where things change let's slip it over here we've got the american made mighty mag now i'm not sure if they are made here anymore but they used to be um and then we've got the chinese one and you can see the epoxy is already coming out that holds the magnet in well it's not only already coming out they fell out so i just sucked up i just grabbed the magnets because i like magnets to hold up prints and stuff once in a while but that's what you get. You get what you pay for. Um, the the brand Mighty Mag is not that expensive. Just buy the don't buy the imports. Look at that. That's there's a perfect example. And uh, again, I love Mighty Mags. Uh, that's actually an old uh, different style magnet. But I, I keep my indicators permanently mounted, so I'm always ready to indicate a vice in, check something for flatness, whatever. But I've I got these on my bench all the time, just mounted to magnets and. I guess this is my pair of Mighty Mags with my initials because back in the day people borrowed these a lot and they didn't return them. So I've uh, got the initials on the side and again I've gotten over three decades out of these just by the good ones. Alright, what's next? Oh, that's uh, me at lunch. Yep, that's the way it goes here at Erie PA. And um, just through that slide in, you know this is a uh, SPI 12 inch digital height gauge I love this thing versus the clicker type the dial type this one uh, saves me so much time I use this thing probably five times a day at least just to check different things of course what you get with the digital is you can touch the top of a part hit a zero set a zero and then move up and down from there and check between things but the clicker ones it's a lot harder you got the dial you're trying to read this was about three hundred dollars and again one of the best investments the company made for me. This thing is used constantly. So if you ever get to the point where you are, are ready for a nice height gauge, a digital one, I can highly recommend this SPI one uh, for 300 bucks. It's a workhorse, works every day. Five years, not one issue with it. I think I've replaced the batteries a few times, but uh, that's to be expected. So on this slide, this is one of my favorite uh, vice stops, and uh, or just a stop. To, uh, I guess it's a vice stop because usually you use it for working the vice, right? So what we have here is a swing away stop. And the only problem I have with this thing, I use it for years as is, I have a couple of them, is I don't like the threaded rod. 
takes way too long to adjust. So what I did, and here's one view of it, I just replaced this part of the knuckle with my own and put a reamed 5 16 hole in there for a 5 16 ejector pin with a set screw on the, on the top. Way faster to adjust. And there's a top view of it, bolts to the table with a half 13. There's a set screw, there's the pin, and uh, here's how they work. Basically, I want to, uh, I got a lot of machining to do on this piece of material, but one of the things I do have to do is mill down the end of both ends here and uh, this to, the, to a dimension. So I've got the stop set here. It looks like there's a gap there. That's only because the uh, head of the pin's been, I think, milled by accident because somebody forgot to move the slide, uh, slide this out of the way before they hit cycle start. But it's it's totally uh, touching on the, on the uh, stop, and then you just swing it away and mill away, and you're all set. So those are incredibly valuable. And the, again, it was a big, big time saver to just change it over to a sliding pin versus the threaded rod. Uh, this is a set of um, no and go and go gauges I built for a large frame that we produce. Uh, they flame cut the slots in this big part and then this is the customer's got a fairly close dimension and this is an easy way for the inspection department to check it. I uh, added these holes to just lighten these bars up and just for fun uh, I've learned over the years if you present your work correctly, people will take better care of it. So when this went to the inspection department, um, I've got the red and green, you know, no-go and go uh, designations here. Now, will those last very long? Eh, probably not that long, but it really um, makes people pay attention. They realize these are gauges and somebody took the time to do that. And uh, the way that looks up close is, there you go, nice, pretty perfectly round circles the way I did that. It was just with some red and green paint markers and my trusty uh, circle template from 1977. See, they're still used for that stuff. And that's another close-up of it. And finally, uh, just for fun, I threw this in there, going through the pictures. That's my collection of parallels. I've got a lot of parallels. Uh, I built all these myself when I was an apprentice. And uh, these are my uncles and my dads. And, you know, and uh, this is a squaring block, was another uncle's. I built these uh, parallels for Bridgeport uh, as an apprentice. One, two, three blocks, one, two, three blocks, one, two, three blocks, lots of stuff. But, And that's about 90% of them because I'm still adding to them almost every day. You can never have enough parallels. And the longer you're in this trade and you do this, uh, they're just indispensable for getting your work done quickly. And finally, uh, that's my studio in the basement here at the house. And uh, that's my big old drafting table where I lay out my work and decide what I'm going to teach that day. See, I got a tripod ready to go. That's a butcher block bench from my mold making days when I had my own shop. That's my father's toolbox. That's Beaver Stadium, Penn State. A couple golf tournaments I've been to over the years, the U.S. Open and the Masters. And that's my picture autographed by Walt Disney that uh, I searched hard for on the internet. Uh, the real one's 15000 but the a museum in London will let a copy go for uh, $16. You can take a guess at which one I got. So um, that's going to wrap up. Um, this part one of real manufacturing. I hope you enjoyed that. Look forward to your comments. There'll be a part two soon. Again, I've got thousands of pictures to go through and just to put these up and make sure uh, these uh, photographs I have are put to good use. And you know, it's just like uh, looking at anything. You pick up something every time you look at uh, something you enjoy, right? Cars, boats, uh, what sports, hunting. And that's what this series is meant to do, is just maybe show you something different you've never seen before. And I know you guys do enjoy looking at stuff that really happens out in the real world. So I'm Phil Kerner, the Tool and Die Guy. And for more videos like this, over 300 more like this, you can always join my tool room at thetoolanddieguy.com. And uh, we will see you on part two very soon. Mm -hmm.